The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 5 not not aid in the name of Brian Whittle on heritage and environmental conservation charities support for outdoor learning. You can stay seated just now. I know you're keen, but I'm just going to just get... You're not, you're not the starting blocks now. <laughs> this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now? And I now call on Brian Whittle to open the debate, please. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to once again speak today on one of my very favourite topics, the importance of outdoor learning. It takes many forms, from school trips to the great outdoors, to developing vegetable patches in our school grounds, to coaching and participating in sports, and many, many other examples. However, in the short time I have, I was just going to pick through a few of those. The Marine Conservation Society, um, of which uh, I happen to be the parliamentary champion of the leatherback turtle, no less, and its migratory path of these turtles from warmer climes to our shores. Um, actually, when I was chatting to them, I was, I was pointing out to them, that is actually geography. And it eats jellyfish, but mistakes plastic bags for food, which has been causing real problems in their population. And the advent of charging for carrier bags has drastically reduced this usage. The impact on the population can be measured by going to the shore and counting jellyfish or discarded plastic bags, which, of course, is numeracy. We can then go back to the classroom and plot this on a graph, which is maths, and this is on top of ecology and marine biology. And the same sort of story happens for the RSPB with the migration of birds, which, of course, is geography, the number of birds, which is numeracy, the painting of the birds in the landscape, which is art, as well as nature. And I had the pleasure today of meeting with the scouts and they are great exponents of outdoor learning. They are, now, they are now working and adapting according to the school's needs by holding their beaver groups at 3 p.m. after school for those areas where getting to a 6.30 p.m. meeting is challenging. These, are, these pupils are not expected to buy a kit because this would be a barrier to participation. Sweatshirts are now handed out to all pupils and collected back at the end of the lesson. They can even take the members out on field trips and experience the great wilds of Scotland for free where this is needed. They train the trainers too. Young people learning skills such as planning and budgeting and leadership, team development, resilience, confidence, and managing difficult situations. Now to me, that sounds very much like middle management and you pay a fortune to attain those skills. In partnership with SAMH, they've designed a program specifically to address the issue of developing poor mental health. You'll not be surprised to hear that young people who have attended the Scouts are 15% less likely to suffer poor mental health in adulthood. And the cost of four years of scouting, £550. And the Fries House has developed classrooms for interactive lessons in subjects such as engineering. They give space in the garden for children to plant and produce their own produce and then learn to cook it. Now, I must give sport a mention here. Sport teaches discipline and resilience and goal setting and confidence. And don't forget the constant learning that the coach does. Coaches learn short, medium and long term planning. They are part coach, part parent part psychologist. They not only deal with triumph and failure, they have to deal with, help others deal with the same and come back for more. And they also get to sound much more intelligent than they look by learning to say things like proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. I'm looking up at our sign language man there just to see how he does that. Fantastic. <laughs> now, I wanted to share some of my outdoor learning experience. Uh, I, I remember many, many years ago in Glacenock House during a weekend away studying O-level geology. We studied the Luger sill and igneous intrusions and sedimentary rock, la rock layers in, in the Luger mine, limestone pavements, clints and grikes. Look it up in a, on, on, on Google. Now, during a discussion about fossils, the lecturer asked us what the first living thing on earth was. A student put their hand up and very confidently declared a brontosaurus. And every time I think about that, I picture a primordial earth with all the ingredients of life just waiting to be energized. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> brontosaurus. Now that makes me laugh out loud. Every Excuse time me, I, I think don't know that. how BSL dealt with that bit. I know, I'm like that. Poof, can you do that again? <laughs> <laughs> that makes me laugh out loud every time. And just the way my mind works, I often wondered who that brontosaurus talked to and what it ate. Or in the middle of the night, and some of us managing to lift a sleeping friend on his mattress out of our dormitory and sliding him under the bed of a teacher. Now that, presenting officer, is a skill. 
scuttling back to our dormitory to await the fallout. Sometimes later, sometime later, amid shouting and screaming, our friend reappeared rather wide-eyed and mad with the teachers in tow. We had, to, we had to wash the minibus inside and out as a punishment, and let me tell you, it was totally worth it. Now, I know, the Deputy Presiding Officer, you're thinking there's a bit of a strangled route to the educational benefit, but the point is that it's a shared experience that I remember. And every time I meet up with a friend from back then, it always comes up. Yes, we learned what we're supposed to in a real live environment, but we also learned about interaction and, and camaraderie and made real lifetime memories. Now, I'm not necessarily advocating that children and young people should follow our lead in some of our behaviours, but they should get the opportunity to access learning in a variety of ways and create their own memories from school days. Changing the venue can change people's thought process. Not every pupil is at their best learning in a classroom. Expand the horizons of learning and bring learning to life. Connect with real environments and new opportunities open up for them in their futures. If we only offer a narrow educational pathway, we will only cater for those for whom that pathway works. As Albert Einstein very famously said, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life thinking it is stupid. There are elements of education and personal development that are crucial in the classroom that are far better learned outside the classroom, like simple interaction and resilience and confidence and team development, focus and attention and problem solving. If we are to proper, properly tackle health inequality and the attainment gap, I would strongly advocate we need to ensure that the inequality and in access to outdoor experiential learning is also tackled. Killeen Country Park, where history continues to be uncovered, have told me that the number of school pupils visited, visiting has dropped from 30,000 to 11,000 recently. And this can be as simple as schools not being able to afford the coach hire. Perhaps this is the way to use the attainment fund in a practical way especially if they collaborate with other schools. East Ayrshire Council have collaborated with schools in the area and a proportion of the attainment fund is used to train the trainers to deliver outdoor learning initiatives. So it can be done. Now I recognise that the government have specifically given this money directly to head teachers through the local council, uh, council conduit to use as they see fit in addressing the attainment gap. So it would be churlish of me to suggest that they should now become more prescriptive in how this money is used. However, perhaps highlighting innovative ways of using the attainment fund or effectively sharing best practice can inform head teachers of alternative ways they could decide to spend the school's money. My concern is, like sport and activity, outdoor experiential learning is more and more becoming a personal learning and development tool for, lo for those who have and excluding those who have not. Deputy Presiding Officer, the attainment fund is perhaps one of the ways of redressing this, and let's face it, all of our children and young people deserve the opportunity to have their own Brontosaurus story. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Whittle. I call John Scott to be followed by Ross Greer. Mr Scott, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome today's debate on the importance of outdoor education in the national curriculum. And I would like to congratulate Brian Whittle on securing this debate on the important subject. Although it is disappointing to note that no Labour members are available to take part in this debate today. Presiding officer, there is a world beyond the classroom and outdoor learning as the gateway to that world. And taking the class outside the classroom, as you will know, presiding officer, can only be rewarding. Because a child's sense of discovery and curiosity is awakened by the natural world. Outside the classroom, children have a chance to guide their own learning and develop problem-solving skills in ways that are not possible in the confines of a school building. A sense of duty and responsibility to the planet is nurtured as children become more aware of the environment and sustainability. And learning outdoors also helps to improve health and well-being too. A recent National Trust survey found that 80% of the happiest people in the UK have a strong connection to the natural world. So if schools can foster this strong connection at a young age, so much the better. Indeed, my own childhood on a remote hill farm environment and the moors and bogs between Barhill and New Luce uh, certainly fostered resilience and being constantly encouraged to get out from under my mother's feet, aged nine or 10, sometimes being a mile or two from home in total isolation, sometimes in self-inflicted, potentially dangerous situations, certainly developed in me a sense of danger and awareness of risk and the ability to be sufficiently resourceful to deal with risk in the countryside. 
However, it is disappointing to learn that opportunities for outdoor education are being stifled by the costs of transport and the squeezing of schools' budgets. And this is especially concerning when we see that the National Trust for Scotland sites such as Killeen Castle and the RSPB's Mershead Reserve offer such stimulating educational programmes at little or no direct cost. In East Ayrshire, Dumfries House offers outdoor learning courses that support horticulture in the classroom and help with the development of a sustainable school garden. In the Peerberg building and the Kaufman Education Centre, school children are introduced to organic gardening, food production and how fresh produce links with a healthy diet. And given the invaluable programmes that are on offer, schools across the country should be being encouraged to use attainment funding to support outdoor education. And there is a solid case for making this happen. And there are well-defined links between access to outdoor education and improved attainment. The John Muir Award is a very good example of this phenomenon. Four challenges lie at the heart of this award programme. Firstly, school children are encouraged to discover a wild place. They then explore this wild place. They, then they take actions to conserve this wild place. And finally, they share their experiences of this wild place. And the John Muir Award is delivered through more than 600 partner organisations and more than 15,000 awards are achieved each year in Scotland. And in a survey of organisations that deliver the programme, 73% agreed that the John Muir Award helps the people we work with improve attainment. The survey also found that the award led to improvement in pupils' self-motivation, self-confidence, self-esteem and a sense of purpose. So the evidence is clear, presiding officer. Outdoor learning stimulates a child's personal development and helps to improve attainment. As the great Scottish conservationist John Muir once wrote, in every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. We must do everything in our power to broaden the horizons of our school children in Scotland and therefore have pleasure in supporting Brian Whittle's motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Scott. I call Ross Greer to be followed by Richard Lockhead. Mr Greer, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. It's almost a novelty as agreeing to be selected this early in the debate. Um, for most people are... Well, I can drop you down the list if you wish. <laughs> no, no, I'm very, very grateful. Good. Although, as Mr Whittle pointed out, I think it is more a reflection of how few members there are in the chamber, unfortunately, for this debate. But for most people, our lifestyles have become too sedentary. We spend too much time indoors, sitting down. Members of this parliament will be familiar with that. Though with one election following another this year, many in politics are currently getting much more exercise than we would have otherwise chosen. But... Too often this behaviour sets in at an early age. Children sit in school all day. They sit in front of the telly. They play inside. Technology makes it easier to experience the outside world without leaving the indoors. And that's not really experience at all. The importance of outdoor learning cannot be underestimated. Being outdoors and appreciating the natural environment is central to childhood development. Through outdoor learning, children learn to engage with their natural environment, learn about the heritage and improve their own health. This involves discovering Scotland's environment, our history, our culture. Right on our doorsteps here, we have Holyrood Park with its crags, extinct volcano, the ruined chapel and its walks. Historic Environment Scotland play a key role in taking school classes to learn about the geography, conservation efforts and the history of land use here. In my own region, there are so many brilliant examples. As highlights, I would suggest Loch Omond and the Trossachs National Park and the brilliant RSPB reserve at Loch Winnock both of which have excellent education and outreach programmes which I've been able to experience firsthand. At Loch Winnock, I was able to join staff and children in lighting a fire and building their own playground from fallen trees and spotting a variety of birds, insects and ground animals. We must ensure that all children have these kind of opportunities and that requires taking a robust but a realistic approach to risk. With proper supervision and instruction, it is fantastically valuable for children to set a fire to use a knife, to take part in a whole range of activities which too often we would consider too dangerous or not age appropriate. Health and safety is essential, but that does not mean restricting children's ability to get to grips with the world around them. There is no substitute for that direct experience and all the benefits that it brings. In Scotland, we are extraordinarily lucky 
to have such a beautiful natural environment and rich cultural heritage, not just available to those in more rural areas, but also accessible from so many of our towns and cities, though it would, of course, be more accessible with cheaper and more accessible public transport to get them there. But through outdoor learning, children gain a better understanding of the natural environment we live in and the importance of protecting it from human overconsumption, from pollution and degradation. They learn to value and respect its intrinsic worth rather than the financial worth that we're encouraged to assign to everything in our lives. But it's not only gaining a better understanding of Scotland's natural environment and our heritage that outdoor learning provides. It brings with it a whole host of health benefits as it encourages children to develop more active and healthy lifestyles. Research has shown that outdoor learning is beneficial to mental health in particular. We've heard in this chamber about problems with child mental health in Scotland, with children facing long waits for services and some not being seen at all. Whilst I would not suggest for a moment that learning outdoors is in any way a substitute for proper mental health services, it is clear that we must adopt a holistic approach to improving mental health in Scotland. And that includes outdoor learning because the evidence for it is quite clear. Despite its long history here, there has been a decline in children participating in outdoor learning. Curriculum for Excellence does emphasize it, but it's not been consistently delivered. It's often charities delivering this service. Too many local authorities under serious budget pressure have withdrawn from directly supporting it. With the support of charitable bodies and existing public environment agencies though, the cost of supporting outdoor learning is not prohibitive. And I hope that the Scottish Government and our new administrations and councils across the country will take this into consideration. We'll look at how they can support outdoor learning for every child in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Greer. Call Richard Lockhead, be followed by Alexander Burnett. Mr Lockhead, please. I'm pleased to be able to support Brian Whittle's debate on the Heritage Environmental Conservation Charity's contribution to outdoor learning uh, in Scotland. And I want to speak in this debate because it's an issue close to my heart, particularly as former Environment Secretary, where I came across so many fantastic projects, the length and breadth of Scotland, where children were being introduced to Scotland's amazing countryside and natural environment. And like Ross Greer, I want to ensure that central government, as well as local government, or NGOs, charities, and everyone else's role to play gets behind the massive potential of outdoor learning for Scotland's children and future generations. Brian Whittle started, of course, speaking about marine wildlife and the need to highlight some of the issues facing marine wildlife to our younger people, something I also support, especially as the newly appointed species champion for the minke whale, which I have to put on record. And I also want to use this opportunity to say that uh, a week or two ago, I had the privilege of speaking at the launch event for the visit to Scottish waters of the Greenpeace vessel Beluga, which is currently going around Scotland's coasts, highlighting the, the plight to our natural environment caused by ocean plastics, which is becoming an increasingly serious issue and which is something our children in school projects and young people of all ages are taking a much closer interest in, as we all should do as parliamentarians uh, as well. I had the opportunity recently to have some discussions with some academics who are looking very closely at some of these issues, particularly Professor Pete Higgins, the Professor of Outdoor and Environmental Education at the Murray House School, Murray House School of Education at the University of Edinburgh, and also his colleague, Dr. Beth Christie. And they have, for a number of years, not only been serving on ministerial work groups, but clearly doing research into the benefits of outdoor education for uh, our children. And one recent literature review was called The Impact of Outdoor Learning Experiences on Attitudes to Sustainability, which picks up on some of the themes other speakers have made already, in that the more out outdoor education their children experience, the more they connect to our environment and environmental issues uh, as well. And as Beth Christie says uh, in her paper on this subject, uh, that a central theme throughout many aspects of the literature she reviewed has been the need to develop an empathy and ethic of care towards the environment. Uh, and this is a crucial point as attitude and ultimately behavioural change stems from a connection to a place. And in other words, young people will make the effort to love and care for something that they are positively connected to. So that's one benefit of outdoor education is connecting young people with uh, sustainability and the need to protect Scotland's uh, environment. And the other paper I want to quote briefly relates to what John Scott was speaking about was the impact on attainment and behaviour in schools. Uh, and again, there are some useful comments in this paper, which I'd want to refer the Minister to. Hopefully I'll have a chance to look at this. Which says that some of the key findings uh, in the review, they refer to the 
a contribution towards increased attainment in terms of specific subject areas such as maths, English, reading, science and social studies uh, and also greater evidence exists to suggest that outdoor learning affords an integration of curricular content and global skill development. So it does contribute also to attainment levels in our schools, outdoor education, and that's another reason why we should get behind it. Can I also ask the Minister, uh, Mark MacDonald, who's uh, closing this debate for the government, perhaps to arrange a meeting with these two academics who are basically the foremost experts in outdoor education, I would suggest, in Scotland at the moment, uh, because this is something which I'm sure he'll find uh, very, very valuable. Finally, in terms of local government supporting outdoor education, there are a number of social enterprises out there in Scotland doing fantastic work that do require the support of local government and their new council administrations. I certainly hope that's the case for the new Murray Council uh, administration once it's formed, who I hope will support Wild Things, which is an award-winning environmental education charity working in my constituency, which has already enabled over 13,000 children, young, peoples, young people and adults to learn from and be inspired by their local natural environments in our wilderness regions uh, of Scotland. They have thankfully just been given £47,000 by Highlands Nellens Enterprise. Uh, they're an organisation based in Finporn, working throughout Murray and beyond. And it's really important that Murray Council continue to support organisations such as that. And also another organisation called Earth Time, who have also been delivering projects in Murray and beyond for young people, uh, in this case, aged from one to eight. Uh, they also run an outdoor nursery based on the forest school principle uh, as well. And these are the sort of organisations that have appeared on the agenda just in the last few years and deserve the support, yes, from central government, but especially local government uh, and under other funding organisations uh, in Scotland. And I would urge the Minister to visit my constituency, to visit those two organisations when he gets the chance. But this is the future. Outdoor education is the future of education in Scotland. We have to give it a central role in reaching attainment levels and promoting health and physical well-being, both mental, me mental and physical, uh, as other speakers have mentioned as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you crammed a lot of requests and inv invitations and information for the Minister there. I hope you've taken a note. Uh, I now call Alexander Burnett, last speaker in open debate. Mr Burnett, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I just note my register of interest, especially those in relation to the National Trust for Scotland and Scottish Land and Estates. Uh, now I'd like to start by congratulating my colleague Brian Whittle on bringing this motion. Because according to the Director of the Swedish National Centre for Outdoor Education, Studies show that if you alternate outdoor and indoor learning and the teacher is prepared, you get good results. Now, I was fortunate enough to have spent most, if not all, of my childhood outdoors and continue to try to be a good example of the benefits of outdoor learning. I was also fortunate to live on the doorstep of the National Trust of Crafters Castle and have very happy memories of playing in the woods and finding haze lemonade bottles to recycle through the shop. A journey of forest management, conservation and the circular economy ingrained at a young age. Now, Crowds Castle is visited by over 7,000 children a year, a huge increase on 35 years ago. But it is important that we acknowledge the tireless work that the National Trust does across the whole of Scotland, and its role has evolved over the last few decades. Outdoor learning has become one of its main priorities, enabling the Trust to teach future generations about Scotland and themselves. The community outreach program supports groups from different social, financial and cultural backgrounds. In 2016, a section of this program, Beyond the Gate, delivered over 2,000 hours of education to over 2,000 school children. Young carers are also targeted and the Trust developed the Counting Stars program to help those who are helping others. Over 25% of young carers miss out on valuable school time and as a result, do not get the qualifications needed to get on in life. However, thanks to Counting Stars, many young carers are being given the tools to overcome these circumstances. This scheme not only enables young carers to get on, but also to find employment, as many jobs require experience. Now, such support is not just limited to the third sector organisations, such as the National Trust. Bodies such as land and Scottish Land and Estates similarly encourage their members to promote outdoor learning. An example of this is Mbaiwu, which means seed in South African, which was a finalist for the Helping It Happen Education Awards. Aimed at 13 to 16 year olds, many of whom are living in urban areas and experiencing disadvantage or poverty of opportunity, this project works with a range of partner estates to deliver a program that educates about the value and opportunity for employment in the rural sector. 
So all bodies, whether public, private or third sector, should receive due recognition for the role in providing outdoor learning and encouragement to do more. I gladly support the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Mark McDonald to close for the Government Minister. Seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome this evening's debate brought forward by uh, Brian Whittle. It uh, provides an opportunity for the Government to restate its commitment to outdoor learning uh, and to acknowledge the great work being done by teachers, support staff and parents across the country. Uh, they, along with uh, organisations and charities at local level, their staff and volunteers, uh, are making sure that children and young people have tremendous opportunities uh, to learn in the outdoors. Uh, it's no accident that outdoor learning is a key component of curriculum for excellence. Uh, the flexibility which teachers have within CFE to provide alternatives to formal educational settings uh, means that they can use their professional judgment and creativity to deliver lessons in a variety of settings using purposeful play and other activities. So by learning in outdoor environments, young people can benefit from meaningful engaging opportunities to apply their skills and knowledge in a real life context. Uh, such interdisciplinary learning allows children's learning experiences to be both broader uh, and deeper. The benefits of well-constructed and well-planned outdoor learning are numerous uh, and have been well stated by members here today. It connects children and young people with the natural world, with our built heritage and with our culture and society. And at the same time, it fosters a respect and appreciation for the outdoors that can encourage lifelong involvement. It brings both challenge and enjoyment for children and young people, uh, motivating them to become successful learners and to develop as healthy, confident, imaginative and responsible citizens. There's also growing evidence that increased access to the natural environment has a direct positive impact on physical health and mental well-being. In addition to uh, fresh air, uh, exercise and stimulation, it can be instrumental in encouraging and promoting uh, positive behavioural change. Uh, we're lucky that in Scotland we have a uniquely rich and varied natural environment and centuries of social, cultural and economic heritage uh, on which to draw. And today gives us all a welcome opportunity to recognise the great support which conservation charities such as the National Trust for Scotland and RSPB Scotland, who've both been mentioned, uh, provide to schools looking to learn in beautiful and inspiring settings. So the Scottish Government continues to support access to our natural heritage through subsidy schemes such as the Heritage Travel Subsidy Grant, which is awarded uh, by Education Scotland and administered by Historic Environment Scotland. Uh, this funding has enabled more than 30,000 pupils from almost 900 Scottish schools to get out and about to explore and to learn from our heritage sites across the country. And uh, members who have spoken this evening of uh, what they see as a lack of opportunity may want to explore the potential of this fund uh, to support uh, the work of schools uh, in their own area. The government also provides a range of support to the third sector, community groups and the youth work sector to promote outdoor learning. Uh, our Children and Young People Early Intervention Fund provides core and project funding uh, for youth work organisations, including those uh, who provide outdoor learning opportunities through the John Muir Award uh, and the Duke of Edinburgh Award. Uh, there are countless examples across the country of schools engaging with uh, and in uh, their local communities to provide stimulating outdoor learning experiences for young people. But it's also important that we recognise that learners do not have to go far to benefit from the rich learning experiences uh, which the outdoors uh, can offer. Um, I want to touch on a few of the, the contributions that have been made uh, throughout the course of this evening. Uh, I, I, like you, presiding officer, I'm going to be very interested to see how the official report handled Brian Whittle's onomatopoeia uh, in this evening's debate and see how that comes out. Uh, but I was interested by uh, his comments around the uh, exclusion uh, factor in terms of uh, those who uh, are perhaps uh, in our more uh, in our less advantaged communities. And I think it's important that we do look at the work that is being done in some parts of Scotland where partnership working uh, is often a key element in relation to this. And I've mentioned it before uh, in the Chamber of an example that I saw in my own constituency of the uh, For Sands and Fountain Family Project, which deals with children uh, in uh, communities of deprivation who don't have access to uh, high quality outdoor learning spaces where they partnered up with the University of Aberdeen to make use of the Botanic Gardens at the University as an opportunity for those children to have a quality outdoor learning environment. So it's, uh, it's often about partnership working uh, in order to provide some of those opportunities. Uh, I think uh, the point uh, was made by Ross Greer about risk uh, and I want to just say uh, and I've said it previously at a number of events uh, centred around our play agenda uh, that there is a big difference between being risk aware 
and being risk averse. And I want to see more of the former and a bit less of the latter. And I think that would chime uh, with the point that Mr. Greer makes. Yes, we have to ensure that uh, risk is managed and mitigated, but that doesn't mean it has to be 100% avoided uh, in order for children to gain uh, a proper and uh, true appreciation of the benefits of learning in outdoor environments. Uh, I'm happy to take a brief intervention from Edward Mr. Martin. Um, first of all, I'd refer the member to my register of interest. I mean, SNH also fund uh, taking salmon into the classroom and then allowing the children to, to take the, the eggs through hatching and then replant them in the wild. Would the Minister be able to give us a, a clarity that that sort of funding will continue as it does presently under the government? Uh, well, I, I, I was going to talk a little bit about Scottish natural heritage and uh, the development of the uh, Scotland's Natural Health Service Action Plan, uh, which is aiming to join up a range of work already taking place around uh, encouraging greater understanding of the natural environment. Uh, in terms of the specific example which the member raises, which I will freely admit I was not aware of until he raised it with me, I'm happy to look further into that and see what role uh, it plays. It may be that part of that work uh, depends upon, as I said, those partnership approaches between SNH uh, and specific local authorities. Uh, and what we always have to balance uh, in all of these debates, and it was uh, meant, pointed out by Mr. Whittle, is that, that balance between the government taking a prescriptive central approach versus allowing that freedom and flexibility at a local level to determine what are the best uh, interventions to support uh, young people's learning in those local areas. And that's what the the pupil equity funding which the government has put in place is there to deliver. It's about ensuring that uh, head teachers uh, have the uh, ability uh, both in terms of the resource but also in terms of the flexibility to determine what are the best approaches for them at a local level. And I would expect as we see um, the uh, work coming forward in relation to how the pupil equity funding is being applied that we will see uh, a number of uh, schools who are operating uh, outdoor learning approaches as part of the work that is being delivered through pupil equity funding. Uh, Richard Lockhead has done his best to fill up my diary, uh, specifically uh, by taking me to Murray on a number of occasions, and I'm more than happy to uh, look into that. I think I've already accepted one invitation from him uh, in relation to one of the organisations he mentioned. Uh, I'm also happy to uh, explore how we can use the work of the academics he cited uh, to perhaps drive some of our agenda in relation uh, to outdoor learning, because in my recent uh, statement to Parliament around um, the expansion of early learning and childcare, I spoke about our uh, agenda to drive forward uh, positive approaches to outdoor learning and to use those opportunities within the early learning setting. And that then flows through uh, into later uh, educational approaches uh, as well. There's another element to this, uh, presiding officer, which I think does need to be highlighted. And that is that as well as looking at how outdoor learning can be promoted within our schools, we also have to look at how families can make better use uh, of the opportunities to get outdoors, uh, to get their children uh, interested in the outdoor environment and to build on some of those approaches. Because if children's uh, exposure to outdoor learning uh, within school is not then further developed within the home environment, we miss a trick, I think, uh, in relation to that. So I'm keen to look at how we can uh, help to encourage families to be uh, more active and more outdoor focused uh, as well in terms of some of the approaches we take around, for example, uh, our play agenda. So the points that Brian Whittle has raised, I think, uh, chime very heavily with the agenda that the government has and that we're seeking to drive forward in partnership with local authorities uh, and other providers. And I uh, thank him again for bringing this debate to the chamber this evening. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of parliament.